Burning Bikinis takes inspiration from an urban legend we heard about. Apparently, bikinis were bought in bulk and burned in a public square in Malta in the 1960s. We discovered that in the late 50s and 60s, a number of women were arrested and taken to court for wearing a bikini. We wish to understand the historical and social cultural context of Malta in the 1960s. Was there a feminist counter movement in Malta? What was the cause of female emancipation? And who were the actors? Who were the women? And what is their role today? I remember her as lying on the wall, the dividing wall, between St. George's Bay and Villa Rosa, which was right across the road. And what happened was that uh, she was um, lying there within view of the public because they wouldn't interfere with private, you know, with a private place. So the policeman arrested her. We were not allowed to wear a bikini, and to do that, we used to have to do it in secret. <laughs> without some tricks and I only lick my wood Once my father found it, because by mistake I took it home, and I remember him trying to, to, to rip it. But in those days the fabric was very good, and he didn't manage. <laughs> the attention of the government has been drawn to the fact that persons of both sexes are frequently seen in bars and other public places near beaches while improperly dressed. The wearing of manifestly indecent bathing costumes, including bikinis. The wearing of bathing costumes without a suitable covering in any public street or place. And the driving about in cars while dressed only in bathing costumes are not permissible. Mind you, Bishop Gonzi became a bishop in 1924. He was a bishop of Gozo at that time. And then in 1943, just during the war, we can say, he was transferred to Malta. He was a good leader. He was really powerful. I still have in my ears his powerful voice. And when Gandhi speaks, it was like the speak of God. My dear Prime Minister, the deterioration in Maltese public morals during the past decade has been beyond anything thought possible. Morality is spiraling steadily downwards and our Catholic traditions many times extolled by the Holy Father are being corroded by public, unashamed, unchecked laxity.
In my last pastoral letter, I was putting the focus on this pernicious situation when I wrote A new philosophy is spreading among us devotees. Today society not only excessively excuses every act of immorality, but has even begun to be unconscious of every moral evil. And this simply because this is what others are doing. Quite often it is heard that everything can be got used to. Last summer, we often read in the local press complaints about persons who pass down public thoroughfares wearing swimsuits. And if someone will go to him, to the courier, and report certain things, he will take action. For example, let's say in Slema, so many beaches, you used to tell him about, about the morality on the beaches. He would be so angry. The, the question of, of, of beachwear in Malta was less to do with women or the rights of women or the position of women. It was more to do with how a woman wearing little clothing might be looked at by a man. So it was a question of, of Catholic morality. Interviewing women in the community who were teenagers in the 60s, we found out that feminist movements were more prevalent in the 70s and 80s. Church was very strong at the time, uh, very, very strong, uh, very powerful. Uh, I remember even uh, the, the pressure and the responsibility put on women's uh, shoulders in when you go to confession. Um, so, yeah, it has to do, of course, with the place of woman. Woman is seen there as, as something to be covered and, 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 and uh, something, as someone to be covered. And, and, and not to be a temptation to, 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 to men. I think a lot of it has to do as well with, with the fact that is when they started to discover um, that there were a few instances of priests being tempted away from the moral path by sex, you know, with women. And as a sh typical with the, Malti with the church, everyone, not just Maltese, it was always the woman's fault. But she was provocative, the old Eve complex, you know. Because you are supposed, you as a girl, to control your boyfriend's actions, behavior, and it still happens today. Eh? Women are made responsible for men's behavior. I think this has a lot to do with the power which Gonzi had and which he exerted not only on women but also of men and with men because that was a patriarchal attitude. Uh, and in those days there was no difference between Catholic morality and social morality because the church was, was dictating what morality is. And that extends to questions like, like censorship of, of uh, films and, and magazines coming from abroad and so on. Um, I remember also the censura, we used to call it, about films. The censura was organized also by the Catholic action. When I'm with you, it's paradise. I remember these songs were absolutely forbidden. Unfortunately, I think that the majority of church people, definitely in those days, we're not aware of metaphor. His Grace, the Archbishop of Malta, has written about the present deplorable state of public morals and suggests the setting up of a special branch of the police force with the exclusive function to safeguard public morality. Admittedly, there has been lately, due perhaps to a marked influx of people whose moral values may not coincide with ours, an aggravation of the situation as regards beachwear and decency in dress, which calls for immediate action on the part of the government. At that time, women, I'm sorry to say, were not given so much importance. I still remember women that they were good teachers, but when they get married, 
they have to stop their job. The discourse about women's rights uh, started rather late here in Malta. I think that really comes then in the, in the 70s. There were different groups, and, and probably more than I can re recall. Um, the, the, um, the Movement Emancipation del Mara, the Movement for Emancipation of Women. But they were in favor of emancipation. It was, it was really trying to catch up a bit with women's rights rather than uh, women's assertiveness. The feminist movement in Malta developed in, in the 70s, in the mid-70s. And we were a group of like-minded women. And we started with uh, emancipazione, movement emancipazione dal Mara. A Malta sono arrivata nel 78 e poi nel, nell'80 è cominciato il Minnaha Tannisa, il, il gruppo delle donne. Mi ricordo che era l'80 perché nel 1980 era un anno bisestile e c'erano i commenti della gente intorno che dicevano «Ah, cominciate l'anno bisestile, è giusto, perché l'anno bisestile è l'anno in cui è permesso alle donne di pensare». E quindi avevamo questa grande concessione di, di essere ammesse in questa, in questa camera così del pensiero. What was expected of me was that I would marry, have children, and live happily ever after. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I was never, never very good at obeying rules just because they are rules. We never thought of women going to work. At the 60s, we start the move. Young girls used to work only as clerk typists with the government or with some factories. But the majority of the Maltese women were at home. Of course, there was pressure from, from society. You had to be home at a certain time. A woman couldn't stay out late. She couldn't smoke in public. She was not. Yes, yes, yes. And even wearing the famous miniskirts that we wore, I mean, it was a problem. It was a problem, like the bikini. <laughs> then we wore the wedges, and then we were called, uh, well, I suppose, naughty, if you like. At the time, there were a lot of pressures, social pressures, not just what you wear, but how you behave, where to go, what time to go back home. So, you know, your role in society was very very, very uh, segregated with regard on the basis of sex. So women's role was very clear with the traditional uh, young woman preparing herself um, to go uh, to become a, a mother, to look after the family and the husband, very important. And uh, why is the man was the breadwinner? In my personal life when I married, being expected, as I said, to fit into a role and having three children in two and a half years. Um, that suddenly made me very aware of how narrow and limited my zone of action was, my ability to express an opinion, um, the fact that many people saw me as an extension of my husband. We were expected to marry young. If you didn't have a boyfriend by the time you were 19, there was something wrong with you absolutely something wrong with you. Then when you got married, if you didn't have children after three years, there's something wrong with you. <laughs> um, other, other restrictions, well, even driving, believe it or not. Here in Malta, there weren't very many women who used to drive. In fact, I would say we were um, the first females, our generation, that insisted that we actually be allowed to drive a car. Also, it was not so nice to see a woman smoking. It was something for us, it was something bad. And then there were also some women who, I'm sorry to say, for us they were bad women working in bars. We used to call them barmaids. They were a taboo for us. I still remember my mother, we were kids going down the Xira front and she used to tell us, don't look at those shops. 
Io venivo da, dagli anni 60 o 68, del 68 italiano, quindi l'attivismo faceva parte della, ehm, così, <ride> faceva parte di me. Eh, il femminismo faceva parte di me, la situazione a Malta nei confronti delle donne non era delle migliori e non ero l'unica a pensarlo ovviamente perché siamo stati in un gruppo a cominciare questa, questo, questo movimento. And I think that the movement which really broke the caste then and, became, and, 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 and projected a militant image was uh, the group Minna Hatan Tannisa. Who worked on family planning clinics, which opened in 19, 1978. Um, and because we were thinking that at the time, uh, Maltese families were still big families. You don't discuss sex. Sex was... È un caso che, su, cui, su cui avevamo lavorato parecchio era il caso di Rose Piteri. Rose era una donna maltese che era stata accusata e messa in prigione per bigamia ehm, e che noi avevamo, a, a, avevamo preso a cuore come, come causa. Era stata vittima all'interno del matrimonio de, 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 della violenza di quest'uomo che poi l'aveva abbandonata e eh, Rose si era, 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 era tornata a Malta, si era, si era rifatta una vita con un uomo libico e per, poter, eh, per, per, per potersi sentire eh, una persona per bene, se vuoi, avevano deciso di sposarti senza sapere che in effetti sta diventando, secondo la legge maltese, una persona bigama. Era stata condannata ad otto mesi di, di, di carcere e ehm, a noi sembrava che questa fosse una, una, una situazione in cui una donna che già era stata vittima del, del, de, 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 all'interno del primo matrimonio veniva di nuovo condannata dal punto di vista della, da un punto di vista da, da un sistema che voleva rinforzare come la donna sia un perno che tiene la famiglia insieme che quindi non è libera di poter fare una vita sua era stata condannata anche in, 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 in relazione al fatto che lei aveva, aveva, aveva fatto un peccato contro la famiglia. Io sono andata personalmente a trovarla a prigione e eh, abbiamo cominciato a cercare di raccogliere firme per cercare di, ehm, di convincere il, la, la Presidente della Repubblica Maltese di graziarla e abbiamo anche organizzato una marcia nell'8 marzo, eh, come tutti sanno, è la, la festa delle donne. Alla fine Agata Barbara, la prima donna eh, presidente della Repubblica a Malta, eh, ha graziato poi eh, Rose Piteri che finalmente è uscita di prigione. Come movimento femminista già eravamo, eravamo state attaccate dalla Chiesa, dal Movimento di Cana, dall'Arcivescovo come un'entità che sta cercando di distruggere la famiglia. Il successo è stato l'ospedale che è uscita fuori parecchi mesi prima di quello che le aspettava. I think I think it was pioneering in the sense that that it encouraged other women to take the initiative. They weren't burning bras in the street or or, 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 or making public demonstrations, but but they they uh, used every opportunity of of expressing their views openly in, in, in when when there were public discussions and debate in the newspaper uh, writing writing letters and so on and it wasn't just about about women's rights it was also about things which are related e quindi sono poi 
cominciate le, eh, le, le, le discussioni su, sull'aborto che così non hanno ovviamente portato alla, alla, alla legalizzazione dell'aborto però hanno portato a una discussione sul controllo del, 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 se si vogliono o non, non si vogliono avere figli e, cercavamo di andare il più possibile al, a riunioni che erano organizzate dal movimento di Cana dal, um, dalla, dai vari gruppi religiosi e cercavamo di, di contrastare eh, quello che veniva detto in queste varie riunioni pubbliche um, scrivevamo sui giornali abbiamo fatto qualche intervista alla televisione mi ricordo eravamo andate di notte a, a fare con, sai, con le spray can come si chiamano? con lo spray, con la pittura spray andare in giro a fare slogan a favore del divorzio per esempio qualcuno ha pensato bene di, di, di coprire in bianco quello che avevamo scritto senza pitturare completamente quindi davanti al, all'edificio del movimento di Cana c'era viva il divorzio scritto in bianco per qualche settimana in una delle varie lettere di scam, di che ci siamo scambiati sulla, su, sul, um, sul Times, uno che aveva più o meno detto che, visto che io credo tanto nell'aborto, um, che magari se mia madre non mi avesse avuto a me il mondo sarebbe stato un po' meglio. Family, family planning. Uh, it was in fact thanks to their pressure that family planning clinics, clinics were, were started here, here in Monta. We worked on the divorce issue, we worked with separating couples a lot, we worked to change the constitution to include discrimination on the basis of sex, we worked to change the family law. This is where it started in the, uh, in the early 80s, this is when we started all this work. And the Catholic Church condemns divorce. But today we know, unfortunately, unfortunately, quite a good number of Maltese do not practice Catholic religion. Um, a un certo punto avevamo alcune di noi, forse non tutte, avevamo um, cominciato a lavorare anche con un movimento che non era più soltanto fatto di donne ma un, un movimento misto per il divorzio, a favore del divorzio. I respect every idea, I respect people who are divorced, they are my friends, but we don't speak about the subject. And they know that I am against divorce, they know that. But still they are friends, I pray for them, but it's up to them. I remember we used to be called this group of Be devil doing it with their, with their, 
hidden new and strange ideas. Don't listen to them. Yes. One of the leading women who taught very much the Maltese generation at that time was Carmen Carbonaro. She used to, every day on the diffusion at that time, used to teach the Maltese women, but not to protest, how to make nice dresses, elegant dresses, how to cook. She was the pioneer of the Maltese movement, Maltese family movement, Carmen Carbonaro. Today she is in Havana. Um, but she was the, she, she was the pioneer of the whole. Every day, every day on the rediffusion, from 10 o'clock in the morning till 11, one hour, every day, all day around, Carmen Carbonaro. Carmen Carbonaro. She was so f famous. And also she was awarded the Gih Republica because she has done very much for the Maltese But not protesting teaching. Even the way you address certain issues, particularly with traditional women and men, women also, I have problems with traditional women, the gatekeepers, who don't want to see any change, who are happy with their situation, who feel that um, people who want change are threatening their lifestyle. And they started feeling that if they don't go out to work like uh, us, that like we did, uh, it was as if um, they're, they're not doing their duty. So whilst we were being uh, put in a difficult situation and told that we are not good mothers and good wives because we went out and continued working after getting married, uh, traditional women also felt this in a different way. Yeah, a quel punto, se eri una donna sposata, eh, straniera, sposata ad un uomo maltese ti davano la possibilità di rimanere perché si presumeva che non avresti lavorato mentre un uomo straniero per un uomo straniero era molto più difficile non, non so se è impossibile ma sicuramente molto più difficile perché si presumeva che avrebbe tolto lavoro ai, ai maltesi quando ehm, sono arrivata e ho fatto domanda per rimanere La lettera è andata a mio marito che eh, ha avuto il permesso di tenermi a Malta. <ride> e, ed erano cose, ma cose, delle cose pazzesche in effetti, pensandoci bene. I was a second class citizen. As a married woman, I couldn't do anything on my own. I needed my husband's signature on everything. Whatever I did, open a bank account, whatever, I couldn't find a job because I was married. You know, it was, you can't imagine. It was so difficult, so frustrating. I remember also um, uh, bands in Malta. Till today, the bands are very popular with the Maltese people. 
but we never thought of seeing a girl or a lady playing an instrument there. But there, there was a lady from Zabar, from Zabar, I think, with St. Michael's band. And she was the first woman. She started. And I remember the, the, the band club saying, what is, what is wrong in there? What is wrong in there? To have a woman playing an instrument with our, bond, with our band. Searching for an answer Io non, ehm, non mi toglievo i peli delle gambe, per esempio. E i commenti che faceva la gente sul fatto che c'era questa donna che passava con le gambe, con i peli, era una cosa assolutamente terribile. Al lavoro, per esempio, uno dei motivi per cui mi avevano tolto dei lavori era perché io mi rifiutavo di coprire le gambe pelose. I remember, and this I will never forget, we tried to find uh, a place for, for ourselves. And my husband used to have to do a lot of work for time at the time. And he, he was afraid that when we had an appointment to, to sign the contract, he may have to go to work. And uh, I, he said, don't worry, you go, you go and sign. And this uh, guy from whom we were uh, buying the place, who was practically illiterate, illiterate, looked at me and said, who, she, she comes to sign the contract? Just because I was a woman. I remember people, women, um, wearing long skirts. I still remember um, women wearing the faldetta, the faldetta, which was very nice, very elegant. And the, and the church here was very strong. It was against women wearing Trousers, for example, in the 1960s, uh, women wearing trousers would not be allowed to stay in church. Never mind miniskirts. Uh, there used to be even problems of women wearing, tourists wearing bikinis on the beach uh, in the 60s. After I, I studied social work in Australia, and when I came back, I, I got a, a, my first my job was as a social worker with, with a church agency. And I remember going there in trousers, which were, you know, in my opinion, quite sort of normal trousers, not particularly tight or not particularly explicit. At the time, I was much thinner than I am now. And um, being told, you know, you know, women don't wear trousers for work in, you know, in, in the Korea. And I said, I don't have anything except trousers, like, and I, I fought that one. <laughs> I thought, you know, no, this is not, I'm not going to start wearing skirts just because I'm working in, the, in, the, in, the, in a church agency. To raise up the morality of the Maltese people, the Catholic Action, which was um, an organization known as the Azione Cattolica, every year used to organize a merry like fashion parade. And that was organized every year in a hotel in Floriana. And many people used to go there. So what happened with Mary Like, that's what it was called, um, with the sleeve thing, many people joined. 
um, it was righteous people who I use righteous in a derogatory sense, you know, who always felt better and always felt they were doing a service to society. These are fashion shows, the merry like, yes, they used to have like merry like fashion shows of sorts, yes, in Malta. I have this image of not a catwalk thing, but sort of like that they, they actually used to present these clothes that were sort of appropriate. Um, the Mary Like movement, let me try and remember now exactly what it meant. Yes, it meant that you had to be very modest in your, mostly in your attire, what you wear. So no straps, um, no short skirts. It's a bit the problem I had. It, it's kind of gels into with the bikini and the miniskirt and the wedges and the sort of thing. Uh, we were told to be Mary-like. And I remember that once a year, the church used to send two or three women round with a statue of Our Lady. And that had to stay in the house for a month. And it was usually, or a week, I think, usually the month of May. And especially at that time, you were told all the time, you know, if you wore a miniskirt, you're not being Mary-like, you know. And even in your behaviour, you had to be modest and uh, subdued. You were only senza una famiglia maltese dietro, senza nessuno che mi dicesse che dovevo andare a, in chiesa, o, cioè, ero molto molto libera, molto libera. Ma per un'altra donna la situazione sarebbe stata molto più opprimente. I still appreciate in the good, in the bad times we share, when the night doesn't want me to scare. I am sorry for certain things, because for me in the past, the mother was the queen of the house. Yes, I repeat what I'm saying. The mother was the queen of the house. At least the Maltese mother used to unite all the family. We never thought of my mother going out to work. We, we always come in here in this house, ma, ma, she always cooking, washing clothes, keeping the house good. Today, life has changed. They have to work today. But we have nice homes, nice houses, but what? We do not have homes. Eh? Nice houses, not a home.
virginity was not a religious concept, it was a social concept. You know, I'll marry a virgin because she's never slept with anybody, so she is mine, like a bit of furniture is mine. But the sixth commandment was paramount. You know, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery, there was something also about the law that a man had to be caught um, flag in flagrante to be accused of infidelity. But if a woman only had a co coffee with a man outside of public view, then it could be used as proof of her infidelity. When I feel a bit despondent, I, I look back. I say, but look, see where you started from, see where we are today. And there has been significant change. So especially when we when we go to the to the 90s, uh, when we started working uh, for the ratification of the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, but which we call the CEDO, because I think it was for the first time in Maltese history that Maltese women from different political backgrounds and NGOs. Uh, we came together and we worked on this white paper. Partners, uh, uh, what was it? Um, partners in marriage. Io poi ho lasciato Malta nel 1985, cioè cinque anni dopo la nascita ad Annisa. Quando ho lasciato Malta, ehm, ancora il Minnahat Annisa era attivo. I am a bit younger than the Minnahat Annisa. <laughs> just a little bit younger than them, than the women who were in the Minnahatanis. I am 58 now and they are maybe like 63, 64. Um, so I didn't, I wasn't in time, so to speak, <laughs> to, to, to be part of that. Um, however, then there was the movement Mara Maltia, um, uh, which I was part of for, for women uh, sufferers of domestic violence. Um, and in fact, the support line 179, which we have in Malta today, owes its origins to the movement Maramaltia. After the 70s, the 80s, I'm not aware that there were any major new movements. Um, you know, the, there was certainly a rising consciousness, however. There was a very, very big change. The minute we started bringing in the, what I call, uh, pop scene, like Beatles, Rolling Stones, there was absolutely no turning back then. Slowly, of course, things, things did change. You know, no longer policemen went to arrest a woman on, on the beach, as they did some, on occasion, because she was wearing a bikini. Now, in those days, you have to also keep in mind that the government was trying to in introduce tourism to, ch to diversify Maltese, uh, uh, the Maltese economy. I think there are other issues. Um, there's a lot of pressure on women to look in a, a certain way, to be beautiful, to be slim, to be perfect. Um, there are new pressures and this is problematic. I was also part of the Manchester Fat Women's Group and that was about saying, you know, hey, you know, you got a problem, stick it. It's your problem. Don't lay it on me. And just because we're fat, it does not mean we're not sexy. And we are still entitled to buy red underpants. You know, if you go into the regular shops, they have colored and, you know, fancy underpants in all the small sizes. When you get to the big sizes, they're white or black. Policing women's bodies, whether it's because they're too covered up or not covered up at all, it is about controlling women and controlling women's bodies. And I think this is what we should be focusing on. And th this is when it angers me then, when people turn around and say, well, feminism is something, it, it's a fight for the, of the past, um, that, that we no longer live in a world uh, where women are oppressed. And I say, no, no, we, we, we do. Well, I think the case of the Burkini versus Bikini debate, which has been arising in France, has, has been showing that sort of, even though women have been empowered, um, and there is sort of been this, this, this call for women's rights and women to be liberated and having the rights to wear what they want, after what happened when women decided to sort of wear the bikini and it has become sort of accepted in society, the Burkini 
has sort of shown that it's not there's no complete sort of liberation to women. I think it has shown that women are still there's still a dress code for them. It's either the, bikini, the bikini sort of represents liberation and the burkini represents oppression, rather than women having the opportunity to really choose how to identify themselves through clothing and decide really what they want to wear. I think there are three dimensions to my identity. The fact that I'm young, the fact that I'm Muslim, and the fact that I'm a woman. Being Muslim is still a very um, new concept, even because there's this idea that Muslim women are coming from the East rather than sort of there are Muslim women who are Western, who are sort of born in the West like I am because I'm Maltese. And I think there's sort of this idea of being oppressed and um, you do sort of what the husband wants and I think there are a lot of sort of this kind of misconceptions which needs to be addressed. Yeah. I, I remember when I was a child I was a member of the Museo, which is a sort of a lay religious order that teaches catechism and uh, in one of my first experiences of being away from home they had taken us for this few days to Gozo and uh, it was the summer and we had gone swimming and uh, the, uh, the members of the order, the, the, the female members obviously, they they swam with their uh, full body bathing suit, but also had this dress uh, over them which floated in the water. <laughs> so it was like this mushroom. Well, I think there's no, I, I mean, the burkini is just the Muslim way of, of, of swimming at the end of the day, because if you're a Muslim person, you're like, and you're wearing the hijab, you're not going to the beach with the bikini. You are going to sort of wear that kind of clothing. But I, I find today's uh, issue with uh, women who, who wear burkinis quite ironic, I guess, because it's, it's uh, I think it's, it's mostly racist. Uh, I, I guess a, a way of, of intellectual laziness that they don't want to take the time to understand and to explore that which is different from uh, from themselves because it's very easy to just stick to the status quo and, and in a sense live with what you are comfortable with but you can only grow if, if you explore new realities, if you are open to, to diversity and, and to different ways of, of living and being and believing. Male-dominated Muslim society requires women to wear, to, to dress in a certain, in a certain fashion. Um, so that I don't find it in itself necessarily a progressive pro-women position. When you have a, a, a society which is not Muslim, which is not mainly Muslim, like ours, um, and doesn't like that, it's not because the society wants to see Muslim women liberated, it's because the society has difficulties uh, coming to terms with, a multicultural, with, a, with an increasingly multicultural society. So, whether you look at the, at, at the bikini episodes of the 1960s or these other uh, Muslim-related episodes of the, of the, well, our time, 2010s, um, I think they, they, have, they have something in common. A, 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 a society which, which is resisting change and which doesn't want, which doesn't want diversity. And the woman there is, is the object. She's not the subject. I think only very recently, actually, with the... Uh, I think with, with the coming of age of the Women's Rights uh, Foundation that we're starting to see women take on uh, certain leadership roles uh, where, where it comes to lobbying for women's rights, which are, go against, really, the, the kind of conservative Catholic uh, norm. Um, so the... the recent, for example, uh, campaign to have the morning after pill introduced in Malta was one such, um, one such campaign. Um, but I think we're, we're still very much behind where reproductive rights are concerned, to which many other issues then are tied. Through my profession, definitely, um, uh, in social work, the majority of clients are women, because in our society, Women are the ones who end up at the bottom of the heap. And it, the empowerment of women in social work is extremely important. And I have not only practiced that, but I have lectured that to, my, to the following social work generations um, because it is very, very important. Yes, I am a feminist. Um, 
And I think, I think it shocks me today that it's almost become a dirty word. Now, when we speak about feminism, I speak about feminisms. There are many different um, feminist stands. I like men. Um, I do shave my legs. So this stereotype of what it means to be a feminist, um, I think, is something that we need to discuss. Um, for me, being a feminist is about acknowledging and fighting for the rights of women um, and not just making it, not just acknowledging women's rights, but also ensuring access to rights. So we're talking about equity. So I think the idea of feminism shows that sort of there is still a lack of women empowerment in society. But I think I'm more for a sort of an equal role for both women and men. For example, if you look at the research on domestic violence in Malta, just the incidence of uh, domestic violence is also, I think, a testament to the fact that as a society uh, we haven't really moved on very much uh, to women's subjugation to, to men, even in, in their private and family life, for example. Um, I think feminist theories give us a lot. They give us a lot. First and foremost, feminist theories look at power, power in society. Um, we look at subjective elements as well of the individual, and we also look at the multi... Uh, let, me, let me turn to intersectionality and, and look at the multi-dimensional aspect of, of being a human being. Now, any human being, at the end of the day, gender is just a part of me. So we can look at how gender intersects with social class, how gender intersects with race and ethnicity, with age, with dis ability with legal status in the case of undocumented migrants, for example, and so on. So I think gendered, gender theories give us a lot. It has been an important, an important influence in, in pushing for change for marginalized populations across the board, not just women. One of the struggles I had to go through is to change my perception of what gender and, and biological sex are in relation to trans people. I, I think also then slowly the realization that a lot of the, uh, the harassment, the bullying experienced by uh, LGBTI people is also because they don't conform to gender stereotypes, that uh, a woman is too masculine or a man is too feminine somehow, uh, or that, you know, in, in a same-sex relationship, who's the man and who's the woman. Um, I think what I struggled most with was um, having a political opinion. Um, I felt I was constantly silenced and and even if we were out socially I felt that the groups would divide into the men and the women and the women would speak about housework and pet and the children and fashion and the guys would speak about politics and I would feel I would feel uncomfortable sitting with the guys because I felt sort of like frowned upon and I, and also frowned upon not taken seriously because I had a political opinion I still feel so strongly that Notwithstanding all the years that we have shouted, spoken out, called attention, raised awareness, still our society remains basically a patriarchal society. We bring up our children in patriarchy. We teach them the rules of patriarchy people's minds and hearts haven't yet changed. They haven't changed to see uh, the effects of patriarchy still today, still. So for me, the most important thing that we need to do is that, I mean, I try and I continue to try, um, uh, but that is the most important thing um, because if you just change, it's, it's sort of like, um, what we do, sadly, is we treat the symptoms, but not the cause. Hmm? And if you treat the symptoms, you, you're going to have to keep on treating them again and again and again. And even in the area of violence against women, and violence against women is a direct result of the inequality within our society, of the patriarchal system, hmm? uh, which values women less, not only women, of course, uh, women, um, uh, black people, um, uh, LGBTI people, patriarchy is the male, the white, youngish, youngish to middle-aged male huh, as the top of the heap and everybody else in varying layers um, below. And that, that um, uh, um, 
that, 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 that idea, that concept, that discourse still runs through all aspects of our society today. And in the field of, for example, violence against women, sometimes I am tired and I flag. Huh? Um, uh, because women speak today, and I think that's what the women were saying 10 years ago. That's what the women were saying 20 years ago. We need more this, we need more that, we're not cons, we're not taken seriously. We're, hmm? And I think, well, so long as we keep on treating the symptoms, we have to treat the symptoms, don't get me wrong. I mean, we cannot abandon um, women victims and survivors of domestic violence and say, well, look, we're not going to give you shelters or whatever because we're going to concentrate on the cause. We have to provide, but it always has to be two-pronged. Uh, two parts. We give them the help and the services that they need, but we also work uh, at digging out the roots. Because so long as the roots remain there, then we are going to continue fighting, if you will allow me to use a Maltese phrase, taza aflilma. You continue, it's like you're fighting, 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 fighting. It's like you're, you're, you're plowing, you know, the, the field. But instead of the field, you're plowing in water. You plow and the water takes over again. Huh? The influence was so much powerful in the 60s of 70s of the teachings of the church. And we still hold that. We're, our base was very good. Today, the base is very weak. Um, it's called profanity. Twenty minutes into his sermon, I cough. A genuine cough. Spittle has a way of working itself into my throat without my knowing how. Can the spleen spit? He frowns straight at me, increasing and multiplying Accolades for modest wives, contentedly augmenting and tending to large families, gratefully waiting on time poor, worn-out husbands back from work. For wasn't it to propagate that God created woman? Nuns in one transept sit poker-faced. He scowls outright when, after the first half hour, Flustered mothers lose control of toddlers, then drones on to law discipline, caution against indulging in excess. Exemplary teenagers further back bow heads, cast eyes devoutly down to browse the mobiles. I also bow my head and cough, and cough, and cough, and keep on coughing. I cough so much, I have to leave the church. Tapping into collective memories and historical documents of women's movements in Malta, we found that as of journalistic or academic records of the era, there wasn't much. We dug deeper. We interviewed women active in those days. We tried to trace those incidents events, and places that were so important to their struggles. All we have is their voices and their witness as the living record of those events.
手。